Hi. We recently conducted a survey of endurance athletes to try to better understand how people are eating before exercise. This is the first part of my PhD looking at nutrition and endurance training adaptations, and the results have recently come out in two journal articles. So I'm making this video to share some of the key findings and highlights with you. The reason we created this survey is because surprisingly little is known about what people are actually eating before the training sessions. So myself, along with my PhD advisors, Dr. Dan Plews and Professor Andy Kilding, created the survey to try to figure out, like I said, what people are actually eating. We split the results into two papers. The first was focused on the fasted training, how often people are doing it, why, things like that. And it's called Prevalence and Determinants of Fasted Training in Endurance Athletes. And that was published in the International Journal of Sport, Nutrition, and Exercise Metabolism. And then the responses related more to what people are actually eating and things like that is published in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition. So to start with some background information on who filled out the survey, it was completed by nearly 2,000 endurance athletes, which absolutely blew my mind. I'm so grateful to everyone who filled out the survey, shared it either on social media or email. It really helped us get a really nice, strong, robust response. If we look at the participant age and sex, most people were between the ages of 30 and 50, um, but we have actually a pretty diverse group that's fairly balanced between males and females. When we look at the competitive level, this is something that people could self-select, so amateur, refers to people who either train but don't race or people who enter races but don't expect to win. High-level amateurs are those looking for podium spots, competing at national championship level events. Elite non-professionals are competing at the international level. And then, of course, we have professionals. As far as the primary sport, people could select more than one. So running, triathlon, cycling, swimming were the most popular, as well as cross-country skiing and rowing. There was a few others that had less than 10 or 15 responses each. The location of people was also something that just blew my mind. We had people from 57 different countries answer the survey, mostly from North America and Australia and New Zealand, but really spread around the world. When asked about their habitual dietary pattern, that is what they follow on a day-to-day -day basis, about half the people don't follow any specific plan, and then the rest were dispersed between things like periodized carbohydrate, low-carb, high-fat, vegetarian, and so on. Also, for those that like to do the math, people could select more than one plan which would explain why the numbers add up to more than 2,000. So we wanted to better understand what are people actually eating before training sessions. And so it's important to understand as a whole what endurance athletes are doing. But then we also wanted to see if there were any subgroup differences. And to do that, we analyzed the results based on sex, based on the competitive level, and based on the habitual dietary patterns people follow. What did we find? Well, to start with, we asked people, do you ever train in the fasted state? That would be waking up, and starting your exercise without consuming anything other than water. And 63%, nearly two thirds of people, do some amount of training in the fasted state, and about 37% avoid it. When we look at the subgroup comparisons, we find males do more fasted training than females. Professional athletes did less fasted training than all others. And for dietary patterns, there was a few differences, but most notably, people that follow a low carb, high fat dietary pattern perform more fasted training than any other diet group. The other ones, NP is no plan, so people that don't follow any plan do less fasted training than those on a periodized carb or high protein diet, and people on a periodized carb do more fasted training than vegetarian or high carb. Then we asked why people do fasted training. So there's a variety of reasons, but the most common were that it helps their ability to utilize fat as a fuel source, related to gut comfort, and sometimes it just comes down to time constraints or convenience. When we look at subgroup differences, we see actually quite a few. There's sex differences basically in almost every answer. We also find a few differences in competitive level. So pros were more likely to do fasted training because someone told them to, and amateurs seemed less interested in utilizing fat as a fuel source as a reason for doing so. And also a number of dietary pattern differences that I won't go into too much detail with. You can always see the full results in the papers. And then we ask people why they don't do fasted training. And the most common reason, or nearly half the people, feel that it just doesn't help their training overall. A lot of people reported they feel terrible during training and, and perform badly, so it's not worth it, or they're getting too hungry. And again, when we look at these differences, we see sex differences for nearly every reason. Then we ask people how often they consume various things before morning workouts. So, for example, how often do you consume a carbohydrate containing food or drink before a morning workout? It's actually pretty split between never, sometimes, and, and often. And there actually were sex differences, competitive level differences, and dietary pattern differences across all of these. We asked people how often you consume a low carbohydrate food or drink, 
and most people never do that. And that would be something, for example, like having eggs and avocado or a protein shake or something like that. About a quarter of the people do it sometimes, but not always, and only about 4% do it before every workout. Then we wanted to understand how people decide what they should be eating. So for example, does your breakfast vary based on the exercise duration? And less than half the people, about 47, 48% say they yes, they eat more before longer workouts and less before shorter workouts. I was actually surprised that it was that low. About a third of the people say they pretty much eat the same thing all the time and then 15, 16% just say they never eat before workouts so it doesn't matter. When we asked if you change your breakfast based on exercise intensity, um, again, it was pretty split. 29% say yes, they eat more before hard workouts and less before easy workouts. And 10.5% said yes, I eat more before easy and less before hard workouts. And then nearly half the people say they're pretty much eating the same thing and don't base anything on intensity. We also asked about the type of exercise. So sometimes people might eat differently before a run as opposed to a swim or a bike or something like that. About 40% found yes, they'll, they'll change, but quite a lot of people just do the same thing before every workout. So overall, this actually kind of surprised me. I thought more people would vary their breakfast. I know I certainly do, but again, that's why we're doing this study to understand what people are thinking and doing. We also asked about supplements that people take in the time period before training. So it's important to note that this is not what supplements do people use ever, but specifically before training. And the reason this is important, this relates to another paper I published this year, looking at the effects of dietary supplements on adaptations to endurance training. So there's some reason to suggest, there's not a ton of research in it, but there's some reason to think that some supplements taken before workouts can either magnify or even blunt some of the endurance training adaptations. So I wanted to understand what are people taking in that pre-exercise window. Most common was coffee or tea, probably not surprisingly. I think it's important to consider that as a supplement because caffeine can certainly affect your training. Protein powder, multivitamin, other caffeine sources, and so on. And when we look at these subgroup differences, there's actually quite a lot. So I'm not gonna go through all of them. Again, you can look, either pause the video or look at the paper, but some interesting differences between males and females Overall, higher level athletes tended to take more supplements, especially the performance related ones like nitrates, beta alanine, and bicarbonate. And then we also wanted to understand what kind of beliefs people have around their pre-exercise nutrition. So for example, we asked, the quality of my workout is the same whether or not I eat beforehand. And while about half disagreed, there was a quarter of people that actually agreed. Skipping breakfast will allow me to get a better workout. Again, a little over half disagreed. And in this case, 14% agreed with that statement and skipping breakfast will allow me to burn more fat during my workout. And 43% agreed and 23% disagreed. Now there was a few other questions we asked, but these three I find particularly interesting because in many ways, they're things that are quite testable, but there's not necessarily clear answers in the research right now. And these are things that I'll be hoping to answer with my current research. So to summarize a bit, around 63% of athletes perform fasted training. Males do it more than females. People following low carbohydrate diets or periodized carbohydrate diets do it more than others. and What's really interesting is that many people think it helps their training, but many people think it hurts their training. So we really need more research in trained athletes to better understand what are the true effects of fasted training. Also, fewer than half of athletes vary their nutrition choices based on the workout duration, workout intensity, or the mode of workout, which is in contrast with the current best practice recommendations to adjust your intake based on the type of exercise you're doing. And nearly all factors we measured vary by sex, competitive level, and or habitual dietary pattern. So I hope you found this interesting. Here again are the two papers that all the data can be found in. And if you don't have access, if you have questions, or if you want the full text, you can shoot me an email right here. Thank you.